thanks ever so much for the invitation to uh, be here today. Um, it's a really great opportunity to just show you a bit of the, the work that we've been doing um, and introduce some of the, the concepts and, and practicalities around sort of using environmental DNA um, in real world situation. Um, my background was that I did, I was a tropical ecologist by training um, and during my PhD I started using high throughput sequencing and metabar coding um, as a way to generate really large data sets on insects actually. Um, to provide data to underpin uh, decision making and environmental management. And we found that back then, even in, so this was in sort of 2012, 2013, um, there was a huge amount of, um, of literature showing that these tools were immensely powerful. And they all concluded with this sentence that said, you know, this is going to change the world of environmental management and solve all of these challenges. Um, for biodiversity monitoring, and then they published them in molecular journals, and no one ever told the environmental managers that, about that they even existed. So we set up Nature Metrics um, really as a way to bridge that gap between all of the work that was being done in the research world um, and people on the ground um, who might find these tools useful, um, so to try and make them accessible. Um, so just, I thought, since I'm going first, I might run over some of the sort of basics of what we're talking about when we're talking about um, the, the sorts of work that we do. Um, so we focus very much on what I'm going to talk about uh, in, in this presentation is environmental DNA metabarcoding. Um, so this hangs really on two, two separate types of, of innovation. Um, the first is metabarcoding. Um, so I think everybody's familiar with the idea that you can take a specimen and sequence its DNA for a particular gene and use the DNA sequence to identify what species it is. And that uses old fashioned barcoding where you have one specimen and you get one sequence back. But using that technology, if you had accidentally a mixture of two different species DNA in your sample, you would still only get one sequence, but it would be a mess and you couldn't read it. So metabarcoding makes use of the, the development of high throughput DNA sequencing, um, which you know, a, a set of technologies that, that allow you to take a complex sample that contains DNA of many different things um, and uh, sequence it on one of these high throughput sequencing platforms. And instead of just giving you one sequence, I mean, the smaller ones now give you sort of 30 million sequences in a single run. Um, so you, you can generate separate sequences for all of the different things in your samples and you can sequence many different samples in parallel. So it really is this sort of huge step change in the amount of um, sequence data that we're able to derive. Um, and you can do metabarcoding on any kind of sample that contains a mixture of different species. So I started off doing it on insects, you can do it on soil, um, you can do it on feces, you can do it on, on pretty much anything. Um, you can also do it on water samples and this is the other, um, the other in a key innovation here, uh, or it's not really an innovation, it's just that we about 10 years ago started to understand that just like when we touch something um, and leave fingerprints which contain DNA, um, animals that are in the water or in contact with water are leaving DNA there. Um, and so the water is basically, you can think of it as like a soup of, of the genetic material of all, of all the wildlife that's been around. Um, and we can capture that um, DNA from the water simply by passing it through um, a filter. Um, and the, the genetic material and particles are, are captured on the filter membrane um, and the water comes out the other side. Um, and the nice thing about environmental DNA from water is that um, DNA breaks down and becomes unusable um, over a period of a few days. Um, it varies slightly depending on environmental factors, but basically it means if you detect something, um, then it's a contemporary signal, it's not a historic one. And that's really useful. Um, so the are many different sort of fancy eDNA sampling um, kits out there. Um, and uh, there's, you know, I think some, a lot of people will have heard of, sort of the Andy uh, backpack eDNA sampling and, and all sorts of really cool gadgets and things. Um, we decided to go for a very, very low tech eDNA um, sampling kit, um, which took us a long time to develop something very simple. Um, but basically the idea that it's something that can be put in the hands of, of anybody anywhere in the world to be able to collect a really high quality um, eDNA sample. So it doesn't require any um, pumps or refrigeration or anything, any sort of electronic equipment. Um, it it uh, has a filter which is enclosed in a plastic housing so that you don't have to handle the filter membrane. So the risk of contamination um, is really low um, and it's incredibly easy to use. 
Um, so we've worked with, I mean, school kids, we've worked with uh, volunteers. You've got my dad on the bottom left there. Uh, we've got ecotourism guides in the Amazon. We've got indigenous, indigenous assistants um, and everybody, all of these people with a small amount of, of training are able to collect very, very high quality um, eDNA samples. Um, and if they're working in very remote environments, then they're able to um, collect samples as they go and store them at ambient temperature and take them to the lab when they get back. Um, so it really does make, make everything very easy for operating in remote environments. Um, so what's sent to the, the lab is basically just this filter unit, um, which, which has got the DNA inside stabilized with a preservative solution. Um, and then in the lab, that DNA is extracted um, and we amplify the DNA of the target group. Um, so that could be sort of very, very broad. You, you could go as broad as sort of eukaryotes, um, or you can go more focused and look at vertebrates or, or fish. Um, or freshwater mussels or all sorts of different groups you can target. And the nice thing is you actually only use a small amount of the DNA that you've extracted from the filter in the, in the analysis that you run. And that gives the potential to be able to, to store and archive the rest of the DNA um, and go back to those samples later on if there's another group that you want to process. So that's then sequenced on a high throughput sequencer um, and you end up with this uh, data file with 30 million DNA sequences in. Uh, which doesn't really mean much to anybody. Um, so there's then a computational process, a bioinformatics pipeline, um, which takes these, uh, these data files and summarizes them because most of these sequences are copies of one another. Um, so we summarize those into a table um, that looks something like this. So it takes each unique sequence and tells you how many copies of that sequence you've got in each of the samples that have been sequenced together. Uh, and then you take each of those unique sequences and run them against a reference database to add taxonomy. This is a really nice simple example from Europe where we know um, everything that is, well, most of the vertebrates in the reference database, we can identify just about everything. I'll show you in a minute what happens when you're in highly diverse areas where you can't identify everything. Um, but the, the question everyone asks at this point then is, is, do these numbers of sequences have anything to do with abundance of the species? Um, and I think initially we were all very conservative about, about that um, and said you've really got to interpret it just as presence absence. What we've seen now is that particularly for groups like fish um, and things that are in the water and shedding DNA at a relatively consistent rate, um, the, these numbers are very replicable and they're very meaningful and they tend to correlate very well with the relative abundance um, of the different species within a sample. Uh, so you can't be precise in terms of saying the number of individuals um, but you can get an idea about, about relative abundance and also changes um, in, in relative abundance across space and time. Um, so we quite often visualize this data using these sort of bubble plots, which um, just, just show that information visually. So in sample one, you can see that 79% of the sequences were, were perch, for example. So there's been a lot of work over the last few years in looking at exactly how well um, these methods work compared to traditional survey methods. Uh, most of that work has been done on fish uh, and most of it has been done in Europe. Um, but I just want to show you a very simple example. Um, so this is, from a, this is data from a BioBlitz event that, that we went to and worked with volunteers who we took out into the field in a national park. Um, and each volunteer collected a sample, um, just half a litre of water, um, from a point where we did have long-term environment agency electrofishing data as well. Um, so the, on the top, you've got the, the eDNA data and each line is one sample collected by a volunteer. And on the bottom, you've got the electrofishing data um, across multiple years going back to 1984. Um, and you can see straight away, A, the sort of consistency of the relative abundance data that we get for the fish from the eDNA. Um, and also, the, you know, each, any single eDNA sample is much more complete than any single electrofishing um, survey effort. And that's something that we see time and time again. So we've now got about 30 examples of this now where we've gone to a river in the UK with long-term EA electrofishing data. And we find that one sample collected by a volunteer um, is better than many years of electrofishing data combined. Um, so this is, there's, there's an awful lot of evidence building up now that um, this works extremely well. 
Um, it works equally, well, it, it also works extremely well in the marine environment. There's a bit more uncertainty about sort of spatial interpretations and, and things. Um, but here we've got a, uh, an example of um, comparisons between uh, overnight netting um, on the left. And the numbers just tell you the, the number of species um, with a three litre eDNA sample on the right. Um, so yeah, there's, there's, there's been a lot of validation effort um, on this. Um, I also noticed, I just added these slides in because I saw there was a question beforehand about how well, we, how, how well these methods are standardized and whether we can compare methods from different pipelines. Um, and this ties in with some work that we've got ongoing at the moment, um, which, which looks to start answering those questions. So we had a conference in the summer um, all around eDNA for the Fisheries Society. Um, and we use this as an opportunity to, we realize we're having everybody who does a lot of eDNA metabar coding uh, would be there at the same place at the same time. So we took the opportunity to go out and get one big pool of water from the river hull um, and said to everyone, just bring your normal sampling equipment. Don't try and standardize anything. Come and take a sample from this pool. Uh, process it however you normally would from beginning to end and let's see how similar or different the results are. So uh, the nice thing was that, so we've got result, preliminary results from three labs. All of these three labs are labs that are really experienced at doing eDNA metabarcoding for fish, generally get pretty good results. Um, and we all made really different decisions to each other at just about every single stage of this pipeline. So the kind of general principles were the same, um, but the exact choices made at each stage in terms of exactly how we did things were, were very different. Um, despite that, uh, yeah, so it, yeah, the very, various hypotheses about which choices might be better or, or worse at each stage. But despite all of the differences, um, this is the, the result. So actually, for the, you know, the, the, the most abundant species, you can see we've got really, really comparable data in terms of both um, detection and uh, relative abundance information. As you get, as the species get rarer, you get more stochasticity and a bit more dropout, and particularly the one lab which did um, slightly fewer replicates of PCR and slightly lower sequencing effort um, sees a bit more dropout. Um, but if you compare this to the traditional fisheries data from the river hull, uh, there's actually only one sample um, which was from, from the same area that this pool of water was taken from. Every single species of fish that's been recorded by electrofishing is found in every single replicate um, from all of the labs. So actually, you know, this is working really well and can be really, really comparable between different pipelines. The key thing is that the individual pipeline is really well optimized based on the choices that have been made within it, um, rather, than, rather than necessarily making exactly the same choices. Um, and we are also sort of collectively, um, I know Alice is going to talk a bit, a bit later, and she's also part of, part of this effort within um, Europe to start looking at, at, at drawing up European standards um, for water sampling for eDNA. And there's a lot of effort going on to try and standardize things um, without being over prescriptive at this stage. Um, so just very quickly, I wanted to show you one of our case studies. Um, so this is some work that we did in collaboration with um, WWF in the Peruvian Amazon. Um, and really they wanted to know about river dolphins, Amazon, manatee, uh, Amazon manatees, and a few species of commercially important catfish. Um, and they were interested initially in whether we could do sort of single species tests for each of those. So we thought rather than doing that, let's do, the, let's do vertebrate metabar coding on the water. And first of all, we check that we have reference sequences for the, all of the key species um, and that they can be identified um, confidently, which they could. Um, so they took samples at 40 points across the northern Peruvian Amazon and took four replicate samples at each point. So each, each sampling point is, is roughly sort of 10 to 15 kilometers apart from each other. Um, and I mean, the first thing was, yes, we found dolphins everywhere, which was good because when you're taking the water samples, the dolphins are literally coming up around you. So if we didn't find dolphins, there was going to be a problem. Um, but, but here I've actually arranged for the, some of the... Um, upper part of the basin. I've arranged the samples from upstream to downstream. Um, and you can see the increase in the, the raw number of sequences that we're getting as you go downstream. So we were able to use this data to look at some hypotheses about sort of how we interpret um, data in these large watersheds and ask whether, you know, is this, an is this a result of accumulation of DNA as you go downstream? Um, or is it actually that the populations are, are greater and the signal is stronger? 
Um, and because we had all of the other species in the data set, we can look at um, you know, whether we see the same pattern consistently. Um, and we don't. We see some species have the opposite pattern. Some species are shoaling species of fish, and you see a sort of big peak at one point, and then um, actually very little signal at the next point downstream. So we're sort of starting to learn about um, independence of, of samples at this scale. Um, and in fact, this fits very well with what we do know about the um, river dolphin populations, that they are um, increasing as you go downstream here. Um, the manatee was another, another target species, um, which was picked up at 12 different locations, sort of centered around this big national park, which is Pakaya Samiria. Uh, manatees are super hard to survey um, using traditional methods, um, so this really helped give them some, some new data um, that is very useful. But overall, I think you know, the, the most uh, striking thing was the, just the sheer diversity of, of species that were picked up um, using this approach. So um, overall, you know, the, the survey effort would have been the same if they'd just been doing a pink river dolphin survey. Um, and we ended up with a data set with about 700 species of, of vertebrates. Um, a lot of them are fish, but actually a huge proportion of the terrestrial mammal fauna for this area um, was detected. So. Uh, including sort of 25 species of bats, we've got all the monkeys, you've got things like night monkeys that you know, are so difficult to survey using traditional methods, but they show up really well in the water samples. We've got jaguars, giant armadillos, giant anteaters, um, all, sorts of, all sorts of really cool stuff. And I think particularly in these environments where you have really regular rainfall, it's just washing the DNA off the land into the river as well. So this becomes a really effective tool for terrestrial biodiversity surveys as well. Um, and then just lastly, I thought it'd be interesting just to, to give you a glimpse of what the data set actually looks like um, for these in these sort of very highly biodiverse areas where we have big gaps in reference databases. Um, because quite often there's this feeling that you can't, you know, you shouldn't start doing meta barcoding until um, you've got a complete reference database. Um, so you can see here that there's, you know, in the top there, you've got a bunch of these are all fish um, and you've got several fish that have been identified down to species level. Um, the, this step of, of assigning taxonomy is, is absolutely crucial um, and you can get it badly wrong if you're overly simplistic about it. Um, so we use probabilistic assignment methods which tend to be a little over conservative actually but it's, we figured it's better to be that way, that way around. Um, but then you can see as you go down there's a lot that can only be identified to, to family level. So this is basically saying you know, this, this is a species uh, within the Chirassidae family um, and we can't put a name on it just yet. But the nice thing is that as, you know, as, as people start doing this, you build up the momentum to fill in the reference databases. Um, and as those grow, you can go back and add the species names onto the existing data sets. You don't need to resequence it. You don't need to do anything else. The, the same data sets just become more and more meaningful. So actually the, the most uh, progress is made when we can do these two things um, in parallel. Um, and even without species names, um, on, on everything, we can still get an, an awful lot of ecological information, looking at community um, patterns and what's driving differences in, in the fish communities in these rivers. Um, so we can see sort of what are the effects of, of natural barriers, what are the effects of different types of water and different sizes of rivers and, and all of those sorts of things. Um, so yeah, there's lots of uh, limitations to, to eDNA, as I'm sure there'll be lots of dis discussion of. I mean, I think that the, the um, lack of ability to count things um, is a key one. Um, obviously, there are times when you need to have data on age or size or condition of animals where you need to see them. Um, incomplete reference databases is a challenge, but it is uh, something that we can work on over time. Um, and obviously, you've got sort of spatial and temporal um, uncertainties. Um, countering that, you just, I mean, the amount of data that can be, that can be gained from using these approaches is, is pretty unprecedented. Um, and it allows, I think, a really sort of joined up approach to conservation where maybe diff people working on different species in the same area um, can sort of pool resources and do much larger survey efforts um, together using the same samples. Um, and this ability to sort of archive and share samples for me is one of the biggest um, advantages. Um, so yeah, I would say this is, you know, especially for fish, this is becoming a very well validated survey method. It is something that, you know, is ready for use as long as, under, as, long as the sort of limitations are understood. Um, it doesn't have any more limitations than any other survey method, I would argue. Um, others may argue against that, but, but my, yeah, that, that would be my position. 
um, and the ability for anybody to take samples. You, know, you might have people in an area who are there for a different purpose um, and they can be collecting biodiversity samples at the same time. So I think that's a real advantage. Um, for us, we are focusing on, um, as well as sort of the, the European area, um, our real focus is, is on uh, projects around the tropics. So um, we have uh, regional coordinators now in place for Latin America, uh, West Africa, uh, including we've got a pilot project with FFI looking for pangolins um, in Liberia and Guinea, um, Southern Africa and Southeast Asia. Um, so if anybody's got um, work going on there, then we're happy to chat about particular projects. And that is it for me. That was fascinating. Thank you. Um, if there are any questions, we have some time, so um, drop them in the chat. But um, in the meantime, there was one specific question that came up during registration from um, one of our members in um, Nepal, who was interested in asking um, in a river, uh, what's the upstream, upstream length that eDNA is documented, uh, that can document the biodiversity? Did you answer that? I don't think you did. No, um, and it depends very much on the river. Um, okay. So it depends. It, de it depends on the, the biggest factor is how fast it's flowing, um, and also how, how wide the river is. Um, I think Alice maybe has a better answer to this because I know that some um, there's been some really good papers cut that have come out from uh, Didier Pont, who uh, I know Alice works with closely, um, and they've actually started to be able to model the the downstream transport distance of eDNA. So it can be anything from like you know, in a low, in a small low, lowland river, uh, really only sort of a few hundred meters um, up to sort of tens of kilometers um, in, a, in, in large fast flowing rivers. Yeah, right. But the, the signal tends to be dominated by things that are close by. That makes so sense. You'll find that it quickly becomes sort of outcompeted by, by other things that are, are, are closer. Okay. Um, David, do you have a, um, a microphone? I'm going to assume that's no. Okay, so David's asking, how do you distinguish between a false positive and a rare? Can you rare hear me now? Oh yeah, we can. Okay, go for it. Oh, okay. Um, so a fascinating, excellent, excellent uh, presentation. One of the concerns, that, of course, that we have is um, distinguishing between false positives and actual real positives, but that are rare fish. And I don't know how you statistically do that or molecularly do that, but I would like your take on, 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 on how serious a problem that might be and how, how you look to solve it. Yeah, it depends what you mean by false positives. I think that there are, um, there's, there's various different uh, types of false positive that you can have. So sometimes it's a, a detection where the, um, you know, the, the DNA is there, but it's got into the water through some other means. So for example, in the UK in urban areas, we'll often find things like salmon in the water, um, it, whether it's not expected, and that's because it's a food fish. Um, and so it gets into the water courses in, in that way. In Scandinavia, we find herring in some unusual places if there have been parties. Um, and, uh, and so and often, they're, often they're marine fish in freshwater environments. So they're sort of relatively easy to screen out. Um, but that's that's one thing one thing to be aware of, and it can be it can be a really real challenge. Um, the other sort of false positive is false. Well, okay, so there's two others. So one is false positives from contamination in the laboratory, um, and there, the I mean, the best thing you can do is just run a lot of negative controls um, at each stage of the laboratory process, so that you can um, check that that you're not getting things showing up in your samples that shouldn't be there. Um, and that just comes down to really good lab practice and, and good quality control pipelines. Um, but you, you know, you should, it, it should be something that's being reported um, by the labs if there's any, any issues with the negative control. Um, the third is, um, I would say, uh, bad taxonomic assignment. So in particular, when you've got the, what, that matching of the sequences against the reference database, um, can be done very simplistically where you just say, okay, what's the closest thing, which will work okay if everything in your sample is in the reference database. Um, but if you've got gaps in the reference database, then it can match to something that is similar but different and may even be something that's in a different part of the world. And then you end up with things that are just plain wrong. 
um, and that is that dents confidence a lot when you you know when you've got samples with things with things showing up in that are, that are just completely um, wrong. So that's where um, being quite sophisticated about the taxonomic assignments in the bioinformatics pipelines, um, I think, is one of the really crucial elements of this whole um, pipeline. Um, and it also, you know, they, and all of these things are helped when if there are strange results, if the, you know, if we get feedback on those, um, then you can sort of look at, at, at what might have happened and where that might have come from and then sort of process of continual improvement. Um, but I would say those are probably the three main types of false positive. Sure, thanks. Uh, and of course, the first two you can't get around, right? I mean, if somebody throws a salmon in your river, you can't, you know, you... Yeah, well, I would say in the, the first one you absolutely can't, the first one you absolutely can't get around. It's one of the things you just have to be aware of um, and know that there's more chance of it in, um, in urban areas and areas where there is human activity. Um, the second one, by with 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 really good lab practice, you can you can really keep lab contamination to to a, a minimum. Um, it's actually not something that we have particular problems with. Um, but then we have you know a, a lot of separate labs that are totally different from one another with a you know unidirectional workflow and and sort of very strict about that um, because right at the very beginning we did have a contamination issue and we, we realized that if we did that it would sort of undermine our whole business so um, we've put a lot of put a lot of um, resource into into ensuring that that doesn't happen and now it seems to be pretty robust thanks awesome okay I can see there's two questions sitting in the chat but um, Kat, I'm going to suggest you pick up Steve's question in the chat because it's quite a technical one. Um, mm -hmm. And Marco, I'm going to bring your questions in into the group discussion at the end. Um, so Kat, thank you very much. That was awesome. And we're going to hand over to Alice now. Mm -hmm.